Thank you so much for tuning into my YouTube. My name is Michelle Hearn and I'm a registered and licensed dietitian and this is the Dietitian's Dilemma where we talk about ketogenic, carnivore, and low carbohydrate diets and you guys, I am super excited today to talk to my farmer. This is Chrissy. So if you've been following me on Instagram, you know that I eat a lot of beef. Beef makes up a very large portion of my diet. And so I've had some people reach out and ask me, be like, where do you get your beef? You know, do you just go to the supermarket and buy it? Do you get it from a farm? And so I actually wanted to bring, the, bring you guys to the farm. I wanted to show you like where do I get the beef and I wanted to have an opportunity to actually talk to we're gonna, we're gonna talk to my farmer we're gonna we're gonna learn about what does it mean to have a sustainable farm and a regenerative farm and so thank you so much Chrissy I really appreciate you joining me today well it's a pleasure <laughs> this is awesome so yeah can you just tell our viewers a little bit about like how you got into farming and um, you know we're actually out at your farm right now just a little bit about how many animals you have and kind of what you guys do Sure. Um, so I, I fell into farming in a very backwards kind of way. I didn't grow up as a farmer at all. In fact, my dad's an attorney. Um, my education is physics and electrical engineering. I took graduate classes in electrical engineering at Columbia, so like I didn't study to be a farmer. Um, but I'm authentically a small town girl. So in my 30s, I was working as an engineer and an engineering manager at Intel, and certainly at that time I could have bought anything that I wanted. Um, I was a vegetarian for a long time, um, and as an engineering manager, I had a lot of kind of low-level health issues. Mm. You could probably even guess what they were. Yes. So I had, I, w I was the same weight more or less than I am now, but my cholesterol was incredibly high, like 300. Um, my bad cholesterol to good cholesterol ratio was nine to one. Mm. Um, I had trouble sleeping, I had skin problems, I had allergies, I was taking Ambien every night to stay asleep, I was taking acid reflux medicine, um, and just never felt healthy. And then the, the worst thing of all was I had really severe anemia. Oh. Um, so finally my doctor, I mean, I, you know, tried uh, um, iron pills and all kinds of things, but eventually my doctor told me if I didn't start eating red meat, I was going to need a blood transfusion. And were you eating any meat at this point? Or? I was eating chicken a little, a little chicken. bit, okay. a little bit of fish, um, but not not a lot. Okay. I mean, I was, I was, you know, trying to follow a good diet. Exactly, the healthy, the low-fat, yeah, so high-vegetable diet, right? High-carb, high car, high low-fat, low-meat, just, you know, like white meat and fish, and boy, that is, was not working for me. No. So, um, so I went to my local grocery store and asked for grass-fed meat, and they kind of looked at me like I had horns growing out of my head, and <laughs> I, I couldn't find any. This was the late 90s, right? And um, so, I mean, we could have called it temper tantrum farm, but basically it was just born in a fit of temper tantrum, right? Well, God damn it, if I can't find <laughs> any beef, I'm just going to learn how to do it myself. I love that. So that's how I became a farmer. That's awesome. And how long have you had um, your farm? How long have you had? 15 years now. I've been a farmer years. longer than I was an engineer and that's longer amazing. than I've been anything else. Wow. And so I imagine <laughs> it was, it's probably been a, l a little bit of an, a learning experience, but you know, we're here and you guys have um, cows and I, I saw you guys also have chickens. Yeah. Um, do you have lamb as well? Yeah. Do you guys? Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, well, tell us a little bit about, so I hear this a lot. I hear this with people that, you know, say like I was a vegetarian or I was eating a little bit of chicken and fish and I just, my health was terrible. I was eating lots of these healthy whole grains. How did your health change when you started incorporating more? Oh, meat? changed dramatically. So, um, I mean, I take bioidentical hormones now cause you know, I'm 56. So, but other than that, I don't take any medications no. at all. So I'm, I mean, really everything's resolved. I don't have much asthma anymore. Um, my good to bad cholesterol is now four and a half to one. So like a complete flip flop. Um, I'm not anemic. My hematologist fired me. He was like, you know, I don't think I ever need to see you again. Go away. Don't come back. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, which is great. I've never been happier about anything. Um, have no trouble sleeping. Funny how a lot of exercise and good nutrition helps with that, right? Wow. Um, 
So yeah, really complete turnaround. My husband was a raw vegan for two years, by the way. Oh wow. His teeth are still in bad shape from that experience. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, you know, when people transition from vegetarianism and veganism, it's, you know, there are sometimes there are health effects that, you know, you're, you're going to have permanent um, issues with. You know, yeah. I grew up, I, uh, ate, I ate, you know, high carbohydrate diet for most of my life when I was vegetarian for a short period of time in high school. And I still, I mean, I had some really bad issues with my teeth and I'm, you know, missing a tooth and it takes, you know, even when you get your health back, unfortunately, sometimes there's still some of that, yeah, that permanent damage. Tooth. <laughs> no, you can't. Maybe someday. But yeah, so, you know, you guys, when I was looking for a farm, because I, I've, I've been really excited about regenerative farming because, you know, I have a lot of people tell me like, look, Michelle, I, I'm starting to embrace this concept that meat could be good for us. Because there's still a lot of people out there that think meat's going to cause heart disease and it's going to kill you. And this is, you know, one of the reasons I'm writing a book. But people say, I'm really worried that it's actually going to be bad for the environment. That's, that's one thing people tell me. And the second thing people tell me is, I can't handle how the animals are treated. I can't watch these large feedlots where animals are whipped and abused. And, you know, we know that there's um, some crazy propaganda out there. And I don't want to say there are, there are definitely some places that that aren't treating animals well. But can you talk a little bit about how you guys treat your animals and raise your animals and you know how they how they eat? We were looking at this you guys a second ago. This is um, this is alfalfa. So this is what they the cows get to eat. They get a lot of this stuff as well as they've got lots of grass to to uh, graze on. But yeah, talk a little bit about you know yeah. animal husbandry and well I that. don't want animals to be treated that way either. And mm -hmm. frankly, that's why I wasn't eating red meat while I was an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's that's how my cows hang out every day. I don't know. They they. I like to say our cows have one bad day. I know I've had more than one bad day, but um, no, they just kind of hang out on the pasture and do whatever they want. They get sunshine. They get weather. They can go wherever they want. They've got 54 acres here to walk around on. Mm. Um, even on slaughter day, we do as much as we can uh, to keep them calm and happy. So what you what you don't really see is um, this little feeding area here. So alfalfa is like their favorite treat. Um, they they love alfalfa. And so we do the feeding here. Every morning we feed and they come up and get their, their daily treat and then they go back out and graze. So on slaughter day it's the same as any other day, right? They come up to feed but then we keep the six that are getting slaughtered that day right here, and the rest go out to the farthest area of the pasture. Mm -hmm. And they just hang out here and eat alfalfa until the slaughter truck comes. Um, because the slaughter truck comes right here where we're sitting. We're oh, actually, well, that's nice. So you don't actually, actually have to physically sitting. take them somewhere So I'll else. just point out that, like, you would never know that animals were slaughtered here a few days ago. It's clean. It doesn't smell bloody yeah. or dirty. Um, but uh, we never truck our live animals anywhere. Um, so that's the reason that you have to buy beef by the quarter the way you do, right? So mm -hmm. if we took our animals to a USDA feedlot slaughterhouse, then they would get a carcass inspection by a USDA inspector, and then you can sell the meat as individual packages of meat. Mm. With this system, which has always been an alternate system ever since the USDA was formed 100 years ago, you actually buy a share of the live animal. Yeah. So your quarter beef that you're getting after the one you're picking up today is probably one of those out there right now. <laughs> you own a quarter of one of those live animals. Yeah. And when the time comes, then we contract with the processing plant together and they process your animal for you and return the meat to you. And it's actually stamped, as I'm sure you've noticed, yeah. not for sale, yeah. right? because it's just for you. Um, meat that goes through the, the mainstream channels is actually a commodity in the sense that cash is a commodity. Mm -hmm. So you can actually use it anonymously to pay for things. Interesting. Um, but with custom processed meat, you can't. It's just for you. Yeah, and you know, the one thing you guys that I've noticed about when you when you buy a share, you know, it's like now, I think one of the main issues with um, our food system today, or one, I think one of the big issues, is we are so disconnected from our food, right? We don't know, a lot of people don't know where does it come from, how does it, you know, it's just like we see stuff packaged and wrapped in the grocery store. So I think it's so important as, you know, if we want to restore our health, that we start to get re, um, reacquainted with how food exists, how this whole ecosystem exists, because there is a narrative that 
we don't need meat. We don't need animals at all. We can live totally fine on a vegan diet. Like if we just eat plants and we're gonna be healthy, it's the best thing. It's cruel to eat animals. So <laughs> I've heard a little bit of your thoughts about this earlier, but could you speak a little bit to what do you think about trying to either grow meat in a lab or even um, farm, you know, just eating crops, like vegan crops? Yeah, so, you know, growing meat in a lab isn't actually meat, right? It's soy, and it, and it is GMO soy, and it is high, it's not organically grown. So GMO really is about the variety in the sense that you might ask for a Roma tomato or a Brandywine tomato. It doesn't say how it's grown or with what chemical. So GMO really is just about the variety, but GMO crops enable using lots of chemical pesticides and herbicides and in some sense require them because they just need more care and attention to be able to thrive. So GMO soy is you know, just a huge chemical crop and it's a monocrop that destroys diversity around the margins of land. And uh, I just don't think the world needs more thousands of acres of GMO soybeans. Um, <laughs> I agree with and you. And when you read these things about, uh, uh, can I say brand names? Oh, yeah. Impossible yeah. burgers needing whatever it is, 85% less water than beef. What they don't tell you, and there's a great new book now called Sacred Cow. Yeah. You know about oh, it? yeah. She's been on she, my YouTube. Yeah. She walks through the, the math really well. Um, they're counting rainwater. So, you know, we live in Western Oregon. We have a lot we of rain. We get a lot of rainwater. And that's why the pasture is green even in late July, right? I think it's disingenuous to count uh, natural rainfall as, uh, you know, some sort of purchased commodity that's that's needed to process beef. That's, that's false. And if you're going to include it in the calculation for beef, we ought to be including it in the calculation for soybeans. Because guess what? Rain falls on soybeans <laughs> too. I grew up in eastern central Illinois. Yeah. 600 miles of soybeans and corn in every direction, right? It rains on the soybeans, but they don't put that in their mouth. Yeah, so it seems like with those with those vegan you know crops with soy and with kale, one thing that I learned, it's also you know, mentioned in the book, The Sacred Cow, is there certainly is a narrative that like, well, if I eat a vegan diet, I'm not causing any harm or any death. And now we know, you know, the latest statistics are showing there's about 7.3 billion animals that die in, in monocropping and vegan crops. And is it cows? No, it's not cows, but it's things like rabbits and gophers. Because anytime you have to clear farmland, you know, you have to kill every animal that's there, basically. Yeah. And maybe, and I think maybe, maybe, maybe you could make the argument, let's say soy was the best thing for the human body. We ate soy and we were nourished and we were vibrant and we were healthy. But it's, you know, it's so toxic. We know that soy has several things in it. You know, it has those um, things that uh, mimic estrogen. It's got uh, trypsin inhibitors. It's got things that um, basically doesn't allow your body to break down protein. So when we get back to our roots, you know, I'm big on this YouTube that we need to get back to a diet that aligns with human physiology. You know, humans uh, evolve eating meat and fat. You know, when you eat beef, it really aligns with human physiology. And, you know, it's interesting because I ate... I, I grew up in Texas, so I've eaten meat, you know, most of my life. You know, I went through that short period where I was vegetarian. That was a total nightmare. But, you know, the reason I started eating way more meat is because I was having so much muscle pain. I just, I wasn't recovering from running, and I actually got to the point where I'm like, I'm just going to have to stop running. And at that point, I was eating 350, 400, I got up to 500 grams of carbs a day, so a ton of carbohydrates. And I thought, well, if I'm not running, I can just eat a lot more meat. You know, I'm gonna eat more meat and more fat. And that's when I started to say, okay, I want the meat I'm eating to align with my values. And so I started, you know, um, reaching out to farmers, you know, and I discovered your farm. And I said, you know, and I, when I, I sent, you know, I sent you an email and I said, hey, I gotta try this before I invest in a fourth of cow. And I love the email you sent back to me. It said, hey, you know what? If you don't like it, we'll buy it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you told me they'd never had anyone in 10 years. And that's kind of how I sold it to, to my wife. I was like, well, they say it, you know, and it, and, the, by far the best meat. If you guys live in the Pacific Northwest, and we're gonna put um, we're gonna put everything in the show notes where you can get their Instagram, you can get their contact information. Um, yeah, this this by far is the best meat that I've ever had. We actually tend to run out about a week or two before we get our next share, so I'm very excited we're here to pick it up as well. <laughs> but I want to know. So we're filming this in in the COVID pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about how has how have things have shifted? Have you had more interest? Have you had more people reaching out? Yeah, we definitely have. Um, so, for instance, um, 
like the last couple of years, we've had maybe two sales a year of a whole cow, mm -hmm. like where one family takes the whole thing, not wow. just a quarter, right? So our, our baseline is about two a year. We've sold eight whole cow orders in the wow. last 30 days. These people must have a you. massive freezer. So it's a it's a combination of things, right? It's it's regular customers buying typically twice as much meat as they usually do. It's a lot of new people finding us who haven't bought this way before. Um, but I mean, really, if you were going to try to design like a public relations campaign to drive people to small farms for meat, <laughs> I don't know how you could have done a better job than what turned out this year, right? I mean. Every single day in the news, we're hearing new things about how bad the mainstream meat processing systems are, right? Uh, underpaying and exploitation of workers, um, bad working conditions, unsanitary working conditions, um, just, you know, it, and it seems like because it's in the news every day, every reporter wants to find a different angle story so sure. there's this breadth of coverage that hasn't happened before because they're all looking for a different angle mm -hmm. um, and then after people hear this on the news they go to the grocery store and it gets like viscerally reinforced because you go to Costco and it says limit three or you go to Safeway and the shelves are empty right so it's just been driving people to small farms it's not just our farm um, and, uh, and then the other indicator that I see is I've had a lot of people telling us that they've got like a Yeah, so, and you know, once people get a chest freezer and put meat in it, which is why else would you buy one, and then you eat that way for several months, they're not going to go back to the grocery store. So it, I, I'm hopeful it's a, it's a permanent shift in values for a, a large number of people. I hope so as well. And you know, I, I and this is why, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for the book Diana has written, and, and I believe, you know, her, her main stance is we don't not need to eat meat. We need to eat better meat. You know, yeah. we need to eat meat that is grown in a way that um, keeps the ecosystem going. Because like you said, when we when we have a system where, you know, um, you know, we have these massive factory farms, they are going to degrade the soil. And we have people working for super low wages and unsanitary conditions. That nobody wants. That's that's not good for the environment. Can I stop you and talk about soil? So like yes. you were talking about monocrop uh, destroying millions of lives, yes, animal yes. lives. And I have had customers tell me, oh, don't be disingenuous. I mean, you can't hold the life of a deer equal to the life of some little soil microbe. Mm. And gosh, I want to I wanna push back on that and say Good. maybe that is really important because a lot of the carbon dioxide that's in the air has been released from the soil, a lot of it from melting permafrost, methane being released during permafrost melting, um, our soils hold a lot of carbon. And the way they hold carbon is by being alive. So when you look at the monocrop uh, large farms, and there's a big hazelnut orchard over here, like the soil is completely dead. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no living anything in that orchard other than hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. and, and I think those lives matter a lot to our quality of life because they contribute uh, to recapturing a lot of that carbon and holding it in the soil where it belongs. Um, and we just don't know. We, we don't know enough. We have all this hubris, but we really don't know what happens when that whole food chain of insects and small animals goes away. Yeah. And we're really at risk of extincting a large number of species in our lifetimes. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a study that um, a, a farm called White Oak Pastures uh, was able to do, mm -hmm. and you know, that they actually, their their farm with the cows using regenerative farming was actually able, they were test, able to test it, put carbon back in the soil, yeah, exactly. but you have to have the animals. That's kind of like the take home message is you have to have the diversity. When you remove it, you know, like you said, on the, these vegan crops and these mono crops, the soil dies. And it's, yeah, I've, I've never thought about it like that, but saying that like this, the soil isn't important and the microbes and the worms and all these things aren't important. Um, you're, I feel like you're, maybe we're missing a critical component because we need that to eventually sustain, to just sustain our life. You know, that's what's gonna grow thing, to grow the grass for the cows to eat, for, for us to eat. So that's a In great fact, point. I think the only way to have a sustainable farm is to have both animals and crops on the same piece of land. Mm -hmm. So what makes confinement animal feedlots just animals, right? So you end up with all this waste, 
which is a lot of nutrition. I mean, composted manure is the most fertile thing that you can put in the soil, but when it's too concentrated, it's a poison. Yeah. And so they sell it. And guess who they sell it to? They sell it to large scale certified organic vegetable farms. And those vegetable farms need it because they're unsustainable. Because when you pull all that vegetative nutrition out of the soil and you're not putting anything back in, wow. it's not sustainable. The way you put the fertility back in is with composted animal manure. But the only kind of farm, if you can even call them that, that is ever going to sell composted manure is the large scale factory farms. Wow. So these well motivated uh, consumers who are trying to buy certified organic produce so that they don't harm any animals actually require the most horrible confinement animal feedlot operations for the soil fertility to produce the crops that they think they're being so ethical eating. So they're literally taking the, you, you're getting the manure from the factory farms for yeah. those for those farms. That's, that's something that I yeah. didn't know. And guess what? All composted animal manure is certified organic by a pen stroke because certified organic is not about measuring chemical residues. It's about, you know, certifying. That's actually true. Yeah. So all those antibiotics and other medications that are in the confinement feedlots are in the manure. And those get brought to the vegetable farm and put on the soil where they affect bacteria and all kinds of things. Who knows what kind of residues are in there. So you could even, you could probably, if like you said, if it is a large scale organic farm and they're not utilizing animals, you know, if it's just a, like a, a fruit and vegetable organic farm, you're likely getting pesticides and antibiotic residue from yeah. the manure of animals. Remember when there was that big E. coli outbreak on packaged spinach? Yeah. Don't you wonder how yeah. did the E. coli get there? It makes sense now, doesn't it? It does. And then what, what was another one? Like romaine, was it too long yeah. ago? And yeah, because it, that makes sense. Like why would they... Why would there be E. coli unless they're mm -hmm. getting tons of manure and if it's coming from a place that, like you said, that's a that's a feedlot? Because you, like your farm, you couldn't sell manure or you wouldn't be able to have... I wouldn't want to. Yeah. I, well, for one thing, how would I collect it, right? It's all out there on the grass, fertilizing <laughs> the grass, and I'm not going to go around with a fork scooping <laughs> it up. But the second thing is, uh, I mean, there used to be an expression in, in farming that a man's worth can be measured by the size of his dung heap. Mm. which is his compost pile, right? And what it meant was, if you're composting a large pile of animal manure, you've got all that fertility to work into your cropland, and that's going to translate to wealth. Yeah. So small farms don't sell composted manure. You're we basically, don't, yeah, you're using it for your yeah, actual farm, which yeah, is that's what we an, That's an important thing our farm produces. We use it all where it's left. <laughs> that's fantastic. And, you know, you guys, one thing about... When you're, you know, when you invest in like an eighth of a cow or a fourth of a cow, you know, as opposed to like, if you're just going to the store and buying meat, like you have no idea, you know, I've heard that you can actually have grass fed meat. They can even say like in the USDA, and, or I'm sorry, in the USA, and it may not even come from the USA. Like there's no, apparently a bunch of loops. processed in the USA. Yeah. Yeah. All, all you got to do is like throw these little softballs off out to me and I can go on for hours. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but, um, but I can, I can like farmer geek out on all of these topics. <laughs> So there are only four corporations in the U.S. that control 80% of all beef processing in the U.S. Wow. And all and that half of that processing happens at 13 physical addresses. Jeez. So they're processing a thousand cows a day, and they come from all over, um, right? I mean, nobody has a thousand cows that they. Yeah. Like, today's yeah. my day for exactly a thousand cows. They mix them, and then. They do the grinding all in a batch, so the meat from many animals, I don't know, scores, hundreds, thousands of cattle, gets all ground together for ground beef. So if one little part of it is tainted, then you end up with these large um, you know, E. coli outbreaks or salmonella breakouts. And I can tell you, as somebody who used to be a quality and reliability engineer at Intel Corporation, if if the smallest unit they can contain is 25 million pounds, I mean, they're going to contain the, the smallest amount they can. They want to sell it. That's why corporations are in business, right? Yeah. Um, but when you get ground beef from us, like in your quarter beef, right, every single gram of meat in that share is from one animal. There's absolutely no mixing. That's and awesome. yeah, it surprises me that people don't 
like grab onto this as one of the key motivators for buying meat from a small farm. And maybe I'm just a Q &R <laughs> and kind of a geek on the subject, but like when you buy your quarter cow today, you're sharing that cow with three other households and I know who they are. Yeah. Just like I have your email and phone number, <laughs> I have theirs. So like if one of you calls me and says you're sick, I can contain the whole animal in yeah. half an hour. And I'd be out $3,600, which is enough that I'd notice, but it's not going to bankrupt me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to trade my property ownership and my income and my retirement and, every, <laughs> and my reputation for $3,600, right? But I can never have a 25 million pound. It'd be impossible for me to cause that kind of damage. Yeah. And, you know, what, what I've learned, like, as we've, um, you know, when you get the quarter cow to, like, just knowing knowing where it's coming from like you guys as you're gonna see we literally have cows right behind us it's like you know that the animal is treated well you know that it's you know I, I've always thought too if you like you said you have all these cows these thousands and thousands of cows coming in they're all being ground up together like how can you not have some issues like you said it's almost impossible not to have some um, you know disease to have some something doesn't go right yeah you know and you're also getting when you buy from a, a, a small farm you're getting a product that you can you can count on like i know when you know when we try it when we whatever meat cut we get we know now what it tastes like we know you know it tastes excellent we know the nutrition is going to value is going to be really great and it's also really fun to like you get different cuts of meat like that's something too that like i grew up we pretty much just ate like ground beef like that's that's all i knew it was you know this this little it always comes in this like tube but when you actually, um, you know, you get a cow, a quarter part of a cow, you get different cuts. Like we get brisket and we get stew meat, and it, I, I feel so much more connected to the animal. Yeah. You know, and you're in the basically process. paying a ground beef price. Exactly. Right? It yeah. It works out to about nine dollars a pound for finished weight, mm -hmm. which is what you'd expect to pay for ground beef. But you know, you're getting New York steaks and ribeye steaks and all kinds of other <laughs> cuts for the same price. Exactly. <laughs> and free bones. Yes, and this so, is one thing we love here. We get free bones. We get free liver. Um, we get organ meats, but yeah, that's one thing I definitely want to hit on price because I have people tell me like, look, I love this idea, but it's so expensive. And Diana does a great job in her book about this, and I'm going to talk a little bit in my book about cost. Um, we are such a quick fix to say, you know, we want we want things as quick as possible and as cheap as possible. And it's one thing to like if you run in a grocery store, or you go to Walmart or Costco, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's only three ninety nine a pound. But you have to ask yourself, what am I getting for this three ninety nine? What, <laughs> what is the long-term benefit to my health, to the planet, to the environment? You know, I would argue that the cost is way more than three ninety-nine a pound. Where, like you said, you know, we spend nine dollars a pound for our meat, but we also get ribeyes, which you know, you go to a grocery store, they're going to be nineteen, twenty dollars a pound. And we're supporting, we're helping, you know, we know that we're helping the environment. We know that we're supporting a local farmer. And, you know, one of the biggest things for me is I'm, I'm fueling my body. You know, I think um, two of my life goals, you know, I want to chase my passion. I want to be the best, um, you know, dietitian. I want to be the best runner I can possibly be. And I want to help others. And when I was really sick and my health was really bad, I wasn't doing either of those, you know. And so the fact that I can eat something that I feel really good about, it tastes delicious, it nourishes my body, and then I can, you know, do everything else I want to do. It's just, to me, it's priceless. To me, I would, well, maybe I shouldn't tell you I'd pay more. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so. Well, the thing is, I'd probably work for less. Yeah. So, I mean, the same thing, right? Like, I, I didn't become a farmer because I was, like, forced into this or didn't have any other options, right? I became a farmer because I needed to take care of myself. And, and so, I mean, a lot of what you're saying resonates completely with me, too. I mean, I was so sick, I really couldn't take care of my family, and I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, I'm just so much healthier now. Um, if I wasn't a farmer, I'd probably be paying to go to the gym. I mean, I love to run. I'm not a runner in your league, but, but running is a, a big joy for me, right? Yeah. And when I'm, when I'm not eating well and when I'm eating too many carbs, um, I mean, I'm 56, right? So this this builds up pretty quick if I start in on the sugar cookies. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I get to, just get to be outdoors and be active and have fun, and I, I feel like I'm not doing any harm. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I feel like what a what a great. I mean, every time we we come out here, um, my wife and I are like, maybe we should move further out. Maybe we should do this. You know. Um, I mean, I just think it's a really fantastic 
thing and I think I love that there are you know people like you that are like okay hey you know we we want to help we want to we want to do something that we believe in that's sustainable that can actually you know help the environment help you know help our bodies help other people all right so what kind of cows do you have what what is the breed and can you tell me a little bit about like their life cycle like how do they come um are they born here? Do you guys get them? How does that How does that work? Yeah, sure. Um, so we actually have a mutt herd. Um, we don't we don't do a, a purebred. I like that. A lot of people with pets will appreciate. You know, purebred animals have a lot of health issues. That's true. Um, so we have a mutt herd. We have a mixed herd of Black Angus, Limousine, and Shorthorn. Okay. Um, the the Angus are kind of uh, like the bulky linebackers of, <laughs> of beef, right? So they, they have kind of a square blocky shape, mm -hmm. big muscles, nice. uh, which is nice when you, you, know, you, want a, you want a big steak, right? You want a big roast um, and they grow fast. The limousines um, are really good mothers, um, which matters when you've got animals out on pasture that the, the babies are well taken care of by their mothers, guarded by their mothers. Um, and the limousines have um, like a finer grained muscle texture that mm. just uh, gives a nice texture to roasts and steaks. And then the short horns um, have shorter legs, mm. uh, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually makes them more efficient grazers than longer legged animals because they don't have to work to get down to graze. Um, and they're just really tough and robust and disease resistant. So awesome. again, when you're going to throw animals out on pasture year round, you want nice, strong, healthy. Usually slaughter between 18 and 24 months. Okay. Um, puberty for a for a beef cow is about nine months. Okay. So it's roughly two to three times the puberty age. Um, pregnancy for a cow is nine months, just oh. like a, a human. In yeah. case you're wondering. That. <laughs> um, we're growing right now. So for the last several years, we've sold more beef every year than we have the year before. So we have to add animals to our herd. It's not a self-sustaining herd because we have more customers every year. Um, Eastern Oregon has a lot of large beef ranches and actually young cattle are almost always raised with their mothers for the first three to four months okay. and, and actually grazed on grass. Even, even animals that end up in feedlots at least have a few nice months in the beginning. Yeah. And then there are livestock auctions where you can buy those calves. So we've been adding to our herd that way. And uh, so they come onto the property at about four months old, and then it takes about a year and a half to grow them out to butcher age. And um, yeah, I guess one of the last things I was thinking about that I want to um, talk about was what is the vision for your farm? Do you want to keep growing? Do you like? Do you kind of you feel like you're at a pretty good spot? I mean, you guys do so many great things. Well, we're at we are at a good spot. Um, in fact, I would say the last three years I've enjoyed farming more than, definitely more than it did the first 12 years. I, I guess we feel like we finally got it dialed in. <laughs> and, uh, we know what we're doing. <laughs> Knocking on something, yeah. yes. Um, you know, so, I mean, we can absorb some more growth, um, but I wouldn't want to be, I don't know, two or three times as big as we are now. It wouldn't, sure. wouldn't be as fun. Yeah. Um, so at some point, and that, and that gets to be a hard message to deliver to people, right? Because then what that means is people come and say, hi, I just found your farm. I just fed beef I want to get some and then I'm gonna to have to start telling people sorry we're full and um, that's that's not gonna be a fun message to yeah. have to, to give I feel bad you know when people are are looking and they've kind of just discovered the bus that you have to tell them sorry I don't have a seat for you so we're not there yet we've still got some more room to grow but um, I don't know within a couple of years we're probably gonna to get to that point so take a message if you're in Portland Oregon you know or anywhere in surrounding area you better get here quickly um, but yeah I mean I guess my hope too is that we are going to continue to see more farmers like you guys that are gonna um, you know want to start getting into this field